Today, we're going to unpack one of the most incredible economic turnarounds of the 20th century. Seriously, it's a wild story about a country right on the edge of collapse, a totally radical plan that nobody thought would work, and some powerful lessons that countries are still arguing about today. So let's start with this number, 450%. Just try to wrap your head around that. It means the price of everything, your food, your gas, your rent, was more than quadrupling every single year. This wasn't some bad dream. This was reality in Israel back in the mid-1980s. The economy was in a complete, out-of-control tailspin. So you gotta ask, how on earth does an economy get that bad? Well, to really get why the solution was so extreme, we first have to understand the crisis that made it the only option left. The whole thing really blew up in 1983. And this wasn't just some stock market dip. No, the country's entire banking system just imploded. This one event completely shattered public trust, sent the economy into an absolute freefall, and basically lit the fuse for that hyperinflation we were just talking about. Okay, so with the whole economy just circling the drain, the government had to do something drastic. And I mean drastic. This was the famous 1985 Economic Stabilization Program. A lot of people call it shock therapy. And it was designed to stop the bleeding and stop it fast. Now, this plan wasn't some single magic bullet. It was a three-punch combo to shock the system back to life. First up, they anchored their own currency to the stable U.S. dollar. Next, they made huge and I'm sure very painful cuts to the government budget. We're talking 10% of the entire country's GDP. And finally, they just turned off the money printers. No more creating cash out of thin air to pay the bills. It was a total economic reset. On top of all those hard economic moves, they did something really smart, something more psychological. They introduced a brand new currency by taking 1,000 of the old, basically worthless shekels and turning them into one new shekel, they were sending a powerful message. We're making a clean break with the past and you can trust our money again. Now, of all those different steps, there was one idea that was the absolute linchpin of the whole program. It's what economists call the nominal anchor. And if you want to understand how they broke the back of hyperinflation, you have to understand this. So what the heck is a nominal anchor? Well, Think of it like this. It's basically a promise. By pegging your currency to a really strong and stable one, like the US dollar, you're pretty much importing its stability. It forces the government to be disciplined, and maybe even more importantly, it gives the public a clear, steady price reference. That's absolutely crucial for breaking that mental cycle where everyone just expects prices to keep going up forever. And this wasn't just some abstract economic theory, right? They put a hard number on it. The rate was officially fixed. One and a half new shekels would equal one US dollar, period. This single number became the bedrock for the whole recovery. It was the anchor holding the entire ship steady in a massive economic storm. All right, so they dropped this massive economic bomb. The big question is, did it actually work? And what happened in the long run? This is where the story shifts from, you know, emergency surgery to actually building a brand new, much stronger economic body. The results? I mean, they were just jaw-dropping. In just two years, inflation fell from that terrifying 450% all the way down to less than 20%. It was an absolutely incredible turnaround and proof that the shock therapy, as harsh as it was, had actually worked. And that success had this huge ripple effect across the whole economy. Inflation was under control, so people started to trust the currency again. The economy, which had been dead in the water, started to grow. And the country's financial standing with the rest of the world got a whole lot better. But here's the thing. That 1985 program wasn't the end of the story. It was the emergency response to the trauma of the 83 collapse. The stability it created was what made it possible to then go in and do deeper, more structural reforms, which started just a couple of years later. So to make sure this kind of disaster never, ever happened again, the government set up a special state investigation. It was called the Bajinsky Commission. Its job was simple, but so important. Figure out exactly what broke the banking system and come up with a plan to rebuild it so it wouldn't break again. And the commission quickly zeroed in on a huge, glaring problem at the heart of the system, a massive conflict of interest. Back then, the same banks that were giving out loans were also managing the entire capital market, running mutual funds, underwriting stocks, the whole shebang. They were both the player and the referee. Just think about that. A bank could be tempted to use its mutual funds to pump up the stock of a company it gave a really risky loan to. 
That is a recipe for disaster. So to fix this, the commission's main recommendation used this really memorable phrase. They called for building Chinese walls inside the financial system. It meant creating a strict, complete separation between the normal business of lending money and all the riskier stuff involved in managing money on the capital markets. It was all about getting rid of that dangerous conflict of interest for good. You know, when you look back at this whole incredible chapter, it's almost like a wild economic experiment playing out in real time. And the lessons from the policies they tested back in the 80s, well, they are far from ancient history. And don't think for a second that this is just some dusty old case study. The main tools from that plan, we're talking aggressive budget cuts and slamming the brakes on the money printer, are front and center in economic debates happening right now. You can see the echoes of this exact strategy today in places like Argentina, which is using its own version of shock therapy to fight its own insane inflation. These lessons are still very, very much alive. And all of this leaves us with a really critical question, doesn't it? This story proves that aggressive shock therapy policies can work and work dramatically. But are they always the right answer? Are they the only answer? What are the trade-offs for the people who live through it? That's a question that economists and leaders are still wrestling with every time a country faces its own economic meltdown.